I think Oregon's ready for Ohio State. I think one side of the ball is more ready than the other. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. Today's episode brought to you by our friends over at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use that code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. So, Talk about Oregon, Ohio State at a glance. The biggest questions that remain on this particular team, but I'm starting with an offense versus defense look. So the defense against Michigan State was simply sensational. Aside from a really smart fourth and two play call from Michigan State where they executed a downfield pass and yeah, Jabbar Muhammad got beat. But he ended up being able to punch the ball out. But Nick Marsh was able to hold on. I'm pretty sure it was Nick Marsh. Like, it was just a really good play. Aside from that, I don't know how you could have any complaints about the defense. And as you look at this Oregon team week by week and the questions we've raised, which I'll dive into later in the show, I have had very few qualms with Oregon's defense. The biggest blemish on Oregon's defensive resume to this point is Ashton Genty, who is quite literally having a historic season. I, I don't know if it's an historic, a historic, I don't know. Uh, one of you out there, you know who you are, is going to uh, let me know which is the correct, correct grammatical interpretation there. He is absurd. And I think he's the best running back in all of college football. That's the only guy. Now, would I feel better if Oregon had held him to maybe like 130 yards and two touchdowns instead? Yes. He is breaking tackles every week that no one should break. He is making touchdowns in a way that makes it look like he's a varsity player that's down on JV. Is he going against Mountain West opponents? Sure. But when he did that against Oregon and he's doing it against everybody else, and I don't consider Washington State a Mountain West team, yeah, I think the guy's just really, really good. So that's the only blemish that Oregon's defense really has so far. And I think the defense is ahead of the offense right now. And that's not the worst thing in the world. And it's not the most surprising thing in the world either. Dan Lanning, defensive guy. This is year three. His players, his transfers, his system, his coaches, everything should be integrated and you should start to take the identity of your head coach. I think that's always a good sign of whatever that coach's identity is, whether it's a position group, whether it is a culture, whether it is a side of the ball, wherever he came from, that aspect of your team should be really good. And I don't know how much better this Oregon defense could be playing right now outside of Boise State. And I think they're a better unit since then. I think they're healthier with guys like Jeff Bossa. But if you look at the Idaho game, how are you going to complain about Oregon's Oregon's defense in that game? They only gave up one scoring drive. The, the other touchdown was a trick play. And by the way, I think the defense has continued to progress. So too has the offense. But this last week's game against Michigan State, the one chance that the Spartans had to go down the field and score, they get inside the five-yard line, they pick up the fourth down. It's not easy moving the football. From the moment that game began, it was hard for Michigan State to get up and down the field. And the one time they did, what happened? Oregon covers a play well, makes a play. Jamari Caldwell had an awesome, awesome first few minutes. I thought his most disruptive sequence as a duck so far. And they force a turnover. And then Michigan State doesn't score again when every first teamer is on the field. Shut out at the half. Like I, I think this defense is as ready as it can possibly be for Ohio State. And I think the matchup is good either way. Whether this was more of a pass-happy team, as they have been in recent years under Ryan Day, or kind of what they've been with Will Howard, a quarterback, which is a run-first team that also has a dynamic passing component because Jeremiah Smith is ridiculous. If you haven't heard of this guy, he's a five-star true freshman, and he, along with Ryan Williams, are the most impactful and spectacularly good true freshman wide receivers that we have in all of college football. And a quick side note, these are the guys that I think about when I think about DeCorey and Moore. That's the sort of instant impact Oregon fans should expect him to have because these guys are 18 or did you know Ryan Williams is 17 years old? As tired as Oregon fans are of hearing that Bo and Tez were related or Bryce Betcher plays baseball, Bama fans have that with Ryan Williams as a 17-year-old. So it's not unique to Oregon is the point I'm making there, but I digress. 
If this were more of a pass-happy team, I love Oregon secondary. This is more of a run-heavy team for Ohio State in that that's what their fundamental identity is. They've got two great running backs. They have a quarterback who's not going to go for 350 to 400 yards. Last time Oregon played Ohio State, who was behind center? C.J. Stroud. What's C.J. Stroud doing right now? He's probably going to win an NFL MVP someday. He, I'm pretty sure, was Rookie of the Year when, when he came out like, Guy is spectacular, and he went for a bunch of yards, and Oregon was very good situationally. They got off the field on a couple of fourth downs in that game to hold Ohio State to 28 points when they had over 500 yards of total offense, over 400 of which came in the air. I don't remember the exact number, but C.J. Stroud went for about a million yards. Will Howard is not going to do that. He's just not that type of quarterback, and it's not the way Ohio State has been playing football. They are a significantly elevated version and more complex version i think of michigan state you know jonathan smith and brian lindgren they've got their schemes and the way that they play and they run the ball first and then they go play action and whatnot and ohio state does a lot of that stuff as well but they have a little bit more shotgun they spread it out a little bit more and i think with chip kelly as a play caller they're slightly more creative the good news is i feel good about oregon's defense no matter what i love where this defense is playing and I think last year's defense was really good. The numbers bear that out. This year's unit looks better to me. They they, they look better to me. Debate that in the YouTube comments below. I imagine recency bias will drive most of you to say that this year's unit's better. But I think that the eye test shows us that Oregon's defense has taken a step forward, which is pretty incredible when uh, you lose your number one cornerback, the late Kyrie Jackson, RIP Kyrie. I still hate that situation to this day, as everybody does. You lose Brandon Dorless, who is your most disruptive and productive defensive lineman from a year ago, but Jordan Birch is elevated to fill that role. Guys who played last year, like Mateo Uyunglele and Tatum Tuioti, they've taken the step forward that you know I, I talked about in the offseason. And then the depth has shown up and the transfers have shown up. And I, I think the biggest question for, for Oregon is is still how do the safeties hold up in coverage? But I, I that's still such a minor question compared to the questions you were asking last year with the matchups Oregon was having to, to go after. Because, yeah, Ohio State has a couple of good receivers. It, this receiving core and passing game as a whole is not as prolific as what Washington put on the field last year. Yeah, Jeremiah Smith is is an NFL caliber guy. Emeka Abuka could be a decent, respectable NFL wide receiver, but it's not it, it's not that sort of team. And I think that th- this matchup, as has often been the case, always been the case when Oregon Ohio State play, going to be decided up front. If that Ohio State offensive line pushes the Oregon defensive line around, you got problems. You've got the play action game. You've got dynamic running backs. Where Oregon wants to be defensively in this game is make Will Howard drop back, throw the football. And he is far more capable of doing that than Aiden Childs and the Spartan wide receivers, or Ethan Garbers and the UCLA wide receivers, or Giovanni McCoy and the Oregon State wide receivers. But those teams like running the football, and they haven't been able to do it so far on Oregon. Ashton Genty has. That guy's incredibly good. RB1 in 2025, no doubt about it. But in the passing game, Oregon is yet to allow a quarterback to throw for 200 yards. I don't know the last time that that happened. I don't know that that's ever happened. I know it hasn't in the Dan Lanning era. Five games in a row, sub 200 passing yards allowed. That's really impressive and demonstrates that not not, not just that the secondary is playing exceptionally well, but that the defensive line is playing really well. And those two things going to have to be in sequence. Every, everything has got to be firing on all cylinders. Ducks are up to a three and a half point underdog at home. Mm, I don't know. Uh, I don't know about that. Debate that in the YouTube comments as well. Still more to come because it's Ohio State week and this is going to be one of the biggest games in the history of Austin Stadium. Maybe the biggest. It's a top three matchup, which has never happened before. Someone can fact check me on that, but I'm pretty sure that uh, I am right. Do the Ducks have enough bulletin board material? That's an interesting question. And that comes down to Dan Lanning. And that is coming up next. 
Coming up right now, though, LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That is why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just a job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job but might be open to that perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't even visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. What you doing? On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Time for the mailbag, YouTube comments, X formerly known as Twitter, or if you want priority access, become a Locked on Ducks insider link in the description below. You can get a free 14-day trial. You get priority mailbag access and a bunch of other perks as well. One of the Locked on Ducks insiders out there asks, hey, Spencer, first off, go Ducks. Well, I completely agree. Go Ducks. Always. Do you think Oregon has enough, quote, billboard material? I think you're going for bulletin board material there, friend to really amp the guys up this week. Also, I feel as if Oregon has the slight edge on Ohio State defensively. They also tend to start really slow, where Oregon starts fast and slows down in the second half. Either way, should be a good game. Wondering what your thoughts are going into it. Thanks. Well, I have many thoughts. I'm going to be talking about it every day on the show this week, every matchup, every game, or every player that will decide the game. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments, by all means, let me know. So, the answer on the, bill, on the bulletin board material question, or billboard material as you put it, comes down to Dan Lanning. This is something that we saw publicly against Colorado last year, where Lanning leaned into, they're going for clicks, we're going for wins. The Cinderella story is over. Okay, Those sorts of taglines, they resonate in a locker room. I'm sure some of you have seen it. I've seen it first person in a Division One college football locker room. When coach speaks, everyone listens. When coach speaks, what he says gets into guys' psyches. So whether or not there's enough bulletin board material out there, there are going to be people that pick against Oregon. I don't know that Dan Lanning needs to lean into that. He shouldn't have to motivate his guys beyond what is required for a normal football game. But you know he's going to try to. And I don't know what that angle is. I just know that if he does it right, Oregon comes out ready to play. And it's a tricky thing to do. You got a bunch of 18 to 22 or 23 to 27 year olds, depending on which school you're looking at here or which player you're talking about, who have got a lot of different factors influencing them, whether that's school, media, girlfriends, wives, family, all sorts of things. How do you get them dialed in for three hours on Saturday night at Austin Stadium? Dan Lanning knows the answer to that question better than anybody else. I don't think they need anything externally. I don't think someone needs to, you know, put a quote out there that says, ah, Oregon's not that good. Oregon's not going to win the football game. And then they play it on a loop. I think the players are well aware. And I think, frankly, the way that the coaches have played the last couple of games in the second half have sent the message that the players know in the back of their minds. We have a job here to do here today against Michigan State. We have a job to do against UCLA. But October 12th is when we need, it, need to be at our best for four quarters. And it's going to be a good test for Landing and his staff and for this team writ large because they haven't had to play a four-quarter game in the last few matchups. They had to against Boise State. They had to against Idaho. But Oregon State, blowout. UCLA, blowout. Michigan State, blowout. Backup quarterbacks, we're in the game by the end in each of their last three matchups. And so I think it's going to be as important on game day as it is leading up to Saturday night that Dan Lanning keeps his guys dialed in for three hours because they haven't had to play a full four-quarter game in a while, but they're going to have to. I, I do not see a blowout either way here. Of course, I would love for Oregon to do that. I don't see that happening. This Ohio State roster is really talented. Every single play is going to be a lot harder, and I think it's going to be a little bit of a slugfest. As for the defense, does Oregon have an edge? I, I don't think so, no. at the, I haven't watched as much Ohio State as I have Oregon this year. I'll talk to Jay Stevens of Lockdown Buckeyes later this week, but I, I don't look at Ohio State and think, oh, they've struggled defensively. I think Oregon could have the edge offensively, but there are still a couple of questions 
for the Ducks to answer, and I'll talk about those later on today's show. But no, I, I don't see an edge. Ohio State has been really good defensively. Their offense has been sluggish at times. Like against Iowa, who has a great defense every single year, that was still a game kind of early second half, and then Ohio State uh, eventually pulled away. But they they did not roll Iowa in the same way that Oregon rolled Michigan State early or that Oregon rolled UCLA. Iowa's also a better football team than either uh, of those two that, that Oregon's played in the last couple of weeks. So uh, good question there. This one came from Willie. Spencer is a fellow golfer. golfer. It has always helped me to have a good swing thought right before I swing. I couldn't agree more. What should Dylan Gabriel's swing thought be going into Ohio State? Also, what is your most recent swing thought? Well, that's a good question. I appreciate the uh, more personal one going at my golf game here, which is something that I take uh, a lot of pride in. My, my, biggest, my biggest swing thought recently has been swing aggressively. I get into trouble when I decel or when I don't trust myself. And Dylan Gabriel trusts himself almost a little too much right now. D- Dylan Gabriel tried to force the ball not once, but twice in the red zone. You can get away with that against UCLA. You can get away with that against Michigan State. Heck, you could have done it a couple times against Oregon State. Probably wouldn't have mattered. Against Ohio State? Nope. Can't do it. I don't even know if Oregon can afford to do that once. Defense would have to bail him out in a big, big way. But... Gabriel knows. No one needs to tell him. No one needs to say, Gabriel's got to do X, Y, and Z. Of course, I'm going to say something anyway, because that's kind of how this arrangement works. I talk, you listen, and you choose whether or not you agree with my particular opinion. But I think Gabriel's swing thought needs to be make the right play. Make the right play. That doesn't mean soften off and don't try to be aggressive. Don't try to push it down the field. Don't try you know, to make explosive pass plays. It needs to be make the right play. Because if he goes back, and I'm, I, I know for a fact that he has gone back. I can't confirm that firsthand, but this is very reasonable speculation on my part. If he goes back and watches those two plays, what he's going to say to himself is, that's the wrong play. That's the wrong. I am, I am rolling way out, granted to my strong side, but still I'm throwing back across my body a little late in the red zone from the one yard line. Can't do that. I roll out that throw to Tez Johnson. I can let that go, but it's got to be sooner. Those were not the right plays. Make the right play. Know how to live to fight another down. I think points are going to be at a pretty solid premium in this game. And if Dylan Gabriel goes into with the mindset of, I need to make the right football play, it would be just fine. That's what I tell him to have a swing thought be. Make the right play and trust that what you're reading is the right play. But also, you know, don't don't dwell on the interceptions, but have in the back of your mind, hey, I can't cost my team points because that could end up costing us the football game. So I like that question. This one from Bobby. Hey, Spencer, I had a few thoughts since the game. First, we look like a Big Ten team against Michigan State, and that felt awesome. I agree. Second, do you think Chip Kelly, a man I have great respect and love for, I agree again, has any advantages given his familiarity with Oregon as the former head coach and with his time at UCLA, or has enough time passed that it is essentially a different organization? Well, our old friend Chip Kelly has played Oregon several times as a head coach at UCLA. The last time game day was in Eugene, Chip was the head coach of the visitors. I don't think it matters a ton. I I, I really don't. I don't know that it matters at all because it hasn't mattered yet. Chip is, by my count, 0-3 in his time coaching in Austin Stadium when he's wearing a uniform that is not that of the University of Oregon. And he comes in as Ohio State's offense coordinator. I think he's been really good so far. They haven't always gotten off to a blazing start, but they always figure it out. And, you know, back to a point that was made earlier on the show, Oregon gets off to the hot start and then doesn't play as well in the second half. I think Oregon's kind of let up in the second half, whereas Ohio State has had to snap into focus. But I think they're functions of the same issue, which is both teams know, okay, we're way better in the team we're playing, and it can be hard to dial in. It sounds easy. It can be hard to be 100% dialed in. Everyone's going to be dialed in for this game. I don't think I'm breaking any news there. That Oregon, Ohio State, I don't think you're going to have an issue where one team comes out, and just doesn't look ready to play, or where they look flat, or they're lacking juice. 
uh, they could start to look a little flat if another team, you know, if one team throws a massive, you know, early punch. But if you can't get up for this game, you're playing the wrong sport. And I don't think these guys are playing the wrong sport. I, I don't, I, I don't think Chip Kelly poses a major advantage for Ohio State in a ma- in, in any way because of his ties to Oregon. I think he poses an advantage because he's a really good offensive mind and he's just coaching ball, not doing anything else. I understand the question though. I speaking of questions, the biggest questions that remain for this Oregon team to me. There's one on the defensive side, kind of, but I've got two on the offensive side, and those are coming up next. After we get to game time, of course, which has a new feature. It's called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. Curation makes it easier to save more on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, whatever you're looking for, they've got it. You get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy so you know what to expect. And Game Time has the lowest price guarantee. Or Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E. That's Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. Couple questions here about Oregon going into this game against Ohio State. I think Oregon is playing a really good brand of football. I want to state that up front. No team ever plays a perfect brand of football. I think if you ask Ohio State fans, and I will ask one in particular by the name of Jay Stevens later this week on the show when we do our crossover, there will be questions like, why is the offense starting slow? Or is Will Howard, has he been good enough? Or is the running game consistent enough? But that's where I want to start with Oregon. So the running game finally exploded this past week against Michigan State. Oregon had not had a carry from a running back of more than, I think, 23 yards or so. Like, Jordan James wasn't struggling to run the football. He was around 100 yards on the ground in just about every game. So it's not as if it was some big, massive struggle through the first few weeks. It just left something to be desired. And one of the things I liked most about Oregon's offensive performance Friday night against Michigan State was there were chunk running plays. Now, the reason I have questions about Oregon in the running game, or a question, is how sustainable is that? How much does that carry over to Ohio State? Because you are now playing a defense that has guys like Jack Sawyer on the other side, or JT Tuomolau, or I don't know if that's the exact pronunciation, but you get the guy that I'm going for there. He's really, really good. Or Caleb Downs in the secondary, who's one of the best safeties in all of college football or Denzel Burke on the outside as a corner. I think it's a fair question to ask of if you haven't been explosive in the run game all season and then you do it once, is that a new trend? Or was that an aberration, especially as you go up against a tougher opponent? Does Oregon need to run the football the way they did against Michigan State to have success and win the football game? No. Jordan James was 150 yards or so in the first half, and Twitter was asking all sorts of questions about, is he going to break Kenyon Barner's record? And then Michigan State made their adjustments. Now, I think part of that was Oregon getting a little bit vanilla with their play calling. I think part of that is when you get a big lead, no matter what coaches or players say, you can lose an edge. And I don't think the offensive line had the same juice in the second half as they did in the first because Oregon knew they had the game won. Now, I hope that that doesn't become a problem against Ohio State, and that comes down to Dan Lanning. Motivating your guys, getting them in the right mindset, that's on the head coach, that's on the position coaches, coordinators, everybody on staff, but it starts with the head coach. So for Jordan James, he finally broke some long runs. Like that first one he had, you know, Connerly had the kick out block. I don't remember exactly what the concept was, but he ran left and he broke it down the sideline after he slipped through an ankle tackle. By the way, side side note on Jordan James. Someone had the comment in a question earlier on the show. You know, we looked at, we look like a Big Ten team. Is there a more Big Ten running back than Jordan James? I mean, he's just built for contact. He wants contact. He wants to run you over. He plowed a couple of guys against the Spartans. It was awesome to see. And that can be a tone-setting element. He also has the ability 
to create big plays in the run game if you give him the opportunity to get a a one-on-one with a safety. And guess what? If you do that, or if a corner's trying to wrap him up, he's probably going to run through an arm tackle. Now, maybe Denzel Burke is a better tackler. Caleb Downs certainly is than the guys Michigan State had. The number 43, I forget his name for Michigan State. That dude is a football player. He was he was really good. I'm not saying Oregon should go after him in the transfer portal this year. I'm just saying maybe they should think about it. But that's an off-season question. Let's focus on the here and now. But when Jordan James finally broke through and had a long run, he hadn't had a 20-yard rush all season, I was watching on my couch, and I out loud – there was nobody around because, well, I live by myself, so I was just watching the game, which frankly is my favorite way to watch. And then all of you were, you know, talking to me and such, and that's really fun. But once he broke free, I said, finally. Fine. Like it felt like, and Landing had said before, it feels like they're close to breaking through. Well, they broke through. And I thought Will Stein did a really, really good job in that first half of leaning on Jordan James and just going back to the well, but also getting him the ball in different ways, right? Getting him the ball on a toss. I mean, the second half, he went with the Wildcat. I think that was Will Stein literally just messing around, being like, you know what? We put this in. Let's see if we like it. We're going to snap it at Jordan James, fake an end around to Dylan Gabriel, make him think we're going to hand it to the quarterback and throw, but we're just going to run a variance of a quarterback sweep with our running back here. And, you know, picked up five, six yards. And I was like, okay, all right. I think the coaches know they got this one in the bag. But those sorts of plays... I I wonder how many of those you can generate against Ohio State. It was great the way they ran the ball in the first half. But how many runs of 10 or more yards are you going to be able to generate against this Ohio State defense? It's not a doubt. It's just a question. Because it's not going to be as simple as it was against Michigan State. You call a lot of the same concepts. Doesn't mean you're going to have the same results because their trench play is vastly superior to what Michigan State put on the field. So that's a question I have. I'll ask a quick defensive question. How are the linebackers going to hold up? You know, Jeffrey Bossa wasn't everywhere. I thought the linebackers did a solid job, but frankly, they didn't have to do very much because the defensive line was just so good. So how effective can Jeff Bossa and Bryce Betcher and Devin Jackson and Justin Jacobs be in tackling these Ohio State running backs. They're going to get matched on matched up on them in the passing game. They're going to have to slow them down in the running game. How are they going to play? This is going to be a big test. Last time they faced a backfield that was on this sort of level, it was Ashton Genty. It didn't go very well. And you can't afford to have that sort of game because if Ohio State is able to run for 200 to 250 yards in this football game, that is going to be a difficult task to ask Oregon to win. So that's the small defensive question that I have, but... I love Oregon's front four. I don't know the state of the Ohio State offensive line. That'll be a question for Jay later in the week. But third question that I have is how quickly can you settle Dylan Gabriel into this football game? Because last week against Michigan State kind of took him a little bit. He got there eventually. But again, that Michigan State team, I think we all know, not on the same level as Ohio State. You're going up against two all-American NFL caliber players in the secondary. And if you make mistakes, they will make you pay. And Dylan Gabriel made mistakes last week, and Michigan State made him pay. But he struggled settling into that game, and Oregon, thankfully, was able to lean on the rushing attack. But if you're not going to have Jordan James go for 150 yards in the first half against, against Ohio State, as he did against MSU, which this may be a hot take, I don't think Jordan James, he could get to 150 yards on the day. If he does it in the first half, you can sharpie in an Oregon victory. I don't think it'll come that easily. Oregon has to play a complete and balanced offensive game. And in the first half, the passing attack kind of took a little while to get going. So how does Will Stein go about attacking that Ohio State defense? How does he want to get Dylan Gabriel worked into the rhythm and flow of the offensive game plan? And how much does he want to have a true balance of, hey, we want to be 50-50 run pass? Or is he going to lean on Jordan James a lot? Or how big of a role does Noah Whittington play? Those are questions that I have for Oregon right now going into this Ohio State game. And there are plenty more. There are plenty more keys. There are plenty more important players. 
If you have a thought, by all means, drop in the YouTube comments, hit me up on X, or become a Locked On Ducks insider. Thanks for making this your first listen of the day. Go make Locked On College Football your second, because I host over there, and I give you the biggest stories in the greatest sport on planet Earth. And let me tell you, it is a fun, fun time. Play more Ohio State coverage coming this week. So let me know what questions you want answered. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and go Ducks.